our next speaker to join us, Damien. Uh, we have uh, Damien Shekelman, who is a principal engineer at uh, Auth0. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Damien. Um, uh, the stage is yours. With we'll, let's share Damien's screen, and I'll and I'll step off the stage. Okay, I just unmuted, and we should be good to go. Let's do this. So. As Carl said, uh, my name is Damien Schenkelman. I'm a principal engineer at Otsilo's Office of the CTO. And one of the topics that I'm researching and trying to solve is the topic of authorization, specifically authorization at scale. And our view is that authorization and authorization really concerns in our software industry are on the rise. And we started thinking, OK, how can we build an API to solve authorization? If we think about how we build software in 2021, there are a number of things that kind of have become mainstays that we have to consider whenever we are either making changes to our existing system or starting something new. Security, of course, is one of them. We don't want to be in the news for a leak. We don't want to have security problems. And of course, naturally, this has changed over the years as we've gone from private networks over to the internet, and we have no longer like that internal network protection. But also in the past few years, we've seen the rise of concerns around privacy and how we keep users' data private and who has access to it and what we show about them. And naturally, for privacy, there are compliance frameworks like GDPR, but there are also a lot of other compliance frameworks that more and more companies have to adhere to to show that they are good at handling privacy and security and auditability features. And we, of course, have specific verticals like medical and HIPAA that have their own compliance frameworks. At the end of the day, all of these are table stakes. You have to essentially build them in order to get on the table and play the game. But it's very uncommon, and it was uncommon a few years ago, not, not that much right now, to have maybe CDS A or CDS B companies that have to be SOC 2 compliant just to get a seat at the table. Now, there's another trend that we're seeing, which is that collaboration is becoming more and more mainstream. And naturally, this started with social media, right? You could post pictures and some of your friends could see it and they could comment. And that's a form of social collaboration. But we've also gotten to business collaboration where you can share documents with other people at your job and, and they should be able to do different things with them, like edit and share them. So you're starting to kind of like get into a collaborative mindset, but not only between individuals and also companies. You have partnerships between different companies and some companies might be able to share documents between people at different places, but also their APIs. APIs are also a means of collaboration, and you might be giving access to some specific partners to your APIs. And at this point, it's more of a differentiator. You're not saying, I need these things to be able to put my product in the market, but they could be the thing that makes someone pick your product or, or your app over someone else's. And the thing that all of these have in common is that they are all about authorization. Now, again, this is important. This is not about authentication. This is not about who you are, which is what authentication does. Authorization is about what you can do, what permissions you have. And authorization is becoming so and so prevalent that the top one OWASP is broken access control, which is essentially broken authorization. Authorization is not working the way it should. If we look at the history of authorization, we, we typically see that both in terms of like historical over the years, but also historical when we look at a specific system, this is how you might start implementing authorization. You might be, let's say, implementing a cust an endpoint to delete a customer by an identifier. And what you would do is you would go get a user role from the database by the cookie user ID. And then if they are an admin, for example, which is the role that they have, you would go and delete the customer. And this is what's known as role-based access control, which essentially means that the actions or the permissions that a user has depend on their role. And these roles are typically global for an entire application for a particular user or for an entire customer, right? If you have a multi-customer or multi-tenanted system. But over the years, as your application and your business becomes more successful, 
you want finer grade authorization. You probably want more control about who can you what. And you probably need that because your customers or your users want something like that. In that specific example, let's say you want to use attributes from the subject, which is the user, and the object, which is in this case the customer that you're trying to delete, to make this decision. Well, a next version of that endpoint couldn't look like this. So we still go to the database, but rather than fetching the role for the user, we fetch the department that they belong to, which is one of their attributes. We go to the customer and we check a Boolean attribute, which is whether they are subscribed or not. And now in our code, we change it so that you can delete the customer if they belong to the IT department and they are not subscribed. If the user belongs to the IT department and the customer is not subscribed. And this is what's known as attribute-based access control. We are considering more attributes from the subject and the object to make an authorization decision. Now, this is not the end of it, right? Your security team, your compliance team, they want to know who performed these actions. So you start logging, right? You start logging who tried to delete a customer, and you also start logging whether they were successful or not. For example, if this operation started to fail and every, someone was trying to delete a customer multiple times with an error, it's very likely that that's unwanted behavior and potentially an attacker, not necessarily real usage. And that's something you'd want to know. And finally, if we think about it deeper, authorization needs to be reliable and fast because authorization is typically in the critical path for every action that your system needs to allow your users to perform. If it, authorization is down or authorization is low, your user's experience gets degraded. And if you sell uh, to customers, you know that that typically affects your revenue. If you sell to other businesses, this might affect some of the SLAs that you have with them. So this is something that you don't want to see fail. This means that there are a number of things that we want from authorization. We want them to be, we want to be able to review access and see who can access what. We want to be able to approve changes to authorization and make sure that whenever we're making a change, it's reviewed by the appropriate people and we are explicit about this being an authorization change. We want to be able to have a trace and auditing for each thing that happens in the system. If someone had access <clears throat> to a particular document, we want to know why, and we know to know when, and we know to know who. So this is a big thing, auditing. And finally, we want this to be reliable. We want this to be up, and we want this to be fast. This is unlike many other cross-cutting concerns, one where performance, as we shared early, is very important. If we think about it, though, we do have developer APIs that have started to do this for other concerns in our industry. We have seen Stripe solve payments, Auxero solve identity and authentication. We have seen Twilio solve communication. And they all do this with an API that is oriented for developers, for application builders, so that they can do their thing, focus on their core product without having to essentially implement all of this themselves. And this is what we were set to do at Auxilio's office of the CTO. We started thinking, hey, what if we could do this? What if we had this API to help people solve their authorization needs? The state of the industry before this, this type of thinking is, is what we think about uh, offering authorization policies. And a policy, if it helps kind of like your, the mental picture and you're not familiar with it, in my mind, looks something like this, right? If a policy is a function, which in this case, again, we, we abstracted with policy name, that's a template, and it takes a set of parameters. It takes the subject, the permission, the object, and some request context. And it runs a set of rules that are defined by your business, your product team, even maybe your engineering team about who can perform a particular action. So the policy might be who can delete customers, and, and that's the decision that you need to make. And then it returns a decision. It returns either allow or deny. It might return other things, but to keep things simple, let's say that that's what a policy does. Now, if we think about it, we need to get a lot of data over for the policy to work, right? The policy is codifying our authorization model, but it's not self-contained. We still need to go to our database, get data that we might need for the decision, which might, we might pass in the context, the object data might not be fully loaded in memory when we're working with this, so we need to go to the object database to fetch this. Um, an example architecture of a system like this might be similar to something like this. So this is kind of like going in steps, but let's say a customer wants to, like this user wants to delete the customer. 
they might send a cookie to an nginx proxy which is let's say our edge api gateway or, or load balancer and then the proxy might call what we call a policy decision point which is a runtime that executes your policies which are written in what's known as a policy language the policy language it's typically not a turing complete language it might not be like a java or a python or a c sharp it might be more of a rule type oriented language inspired by a prologue or data load but they are still fairly flexible right and, and they allow you to express fairly rich policies and rich authorization rules now before you actually run the policy you might need to get the user and customer data especially if it's not part of the cookie or the token that you were passing along so you need to go to what's known as a policy information post point which might be a postgres database you go back you evaluate the policy and then the user is authorized and because of that you can go delete the customer this is the whole flow of what needs to happen and in order to kind of like do what we said earlier we also need what's known as a pap or a policy authoring point where we need to manage policies and be able to deploy them to these policy decision points the good thing is that this solves the problem but it's still kind of like doing authorization in different parts right we have policy information points and policy decision points and the execution of our authorization logic depends on both of those the good thing is that again this is easier to understand right we if we go to read all of our policy code we'll know what authorization logic applies we will be able to do authorization change management at the policy offering point the pap and it's simpler than how you did in code you won't have to crawl through all your all of your if statements to figure out who can do what and finally auditing can be implemented outside of your business logic as a cross-cutting concern by just adding auditing to the policy runtime the disadvantage is as naturally this requires operating a few more components which are essentially the policy decision point you might have different policy enforcement points someone needs to run or host or provide as a service the policy authoring point and the policy registry so that's additional infrastructure and as a developer as a builder you need to interact with all of those but in our opinion even more importantly the problem is that these types of solutions do not handle storage of authorization data if you have instead of one database if you have multiple services and you need to make an authorization decision based on let's say three or four of those your latency is the latency of your slowest service your reliability is the combination of all of the four services failures and the same thing for your scale and you typically don't want to tie your authorization use cases your authorization queries to all of your other business logic that's what we've learned not to do that's why patterns like secure rest came up you you differentiate different use cases and you optimize for cached views of different uh, of these use cases right you have read views for maybe your customer says which might be different than your user access patterns and finally authorization policies don't work well in collaboration scenarios let's think about cases like google drive or github where you have thousands or millions of objects fetching the list of all of the documents that you can access in a github or a google drive case and run it in, through a policy is not efficient for each authorization check your networking cost will be high but also you still need a store that can store all of these relationships in some way or another which means that yes as long as you can put everything in memory the policy engine will work and will do what you need but if you can't do that then what should you do and a new approach that we're seeing it's what's known as a zanzibar inspired approach and this is the one we took and we think is going to be very interesting for the future of developer authorization now zanzibar is not the island but it's actually a paper written by google and this paper explains how google built a system that powers authorization for all of their internal for all of their products for calendar cloud drive pictures youtube etc the fact that this system works and it works at google means that of course it needs to handle google scale but because it can handle a lot of google products it also means it's fairly flexible the way sansor works and unlike what we were seeing earlier with rbac which is role-based access control and abac which is attribute-based access control is doing reback which is relationship-based access control a user's ability to perform an action on an object let's say a user's ability to view a document depends on the relationship to the document for example i might be able to view a document if i am a viewer of the folder that contains the document and that's a common policy for example for systems like google drive 
The other thing Google does is they deploy this Zanzibar system in a multi-region active-active setup. So each client, which might be, again, all of these Google products like Cloud, like Drive, like YouTube, goes to the closest region, and that minimizes latency. But at the same time, because this is multi-region, it increases availability. If one region fails, you can route, you can route traffic to the nearest region while trading that off for some latency. And we believe that Zanzibar is kind of like in the sweet spot between policies, which cover all of your authorization needs because of their flexibility, but don't handle storage, which means that as a developer, as a company, you still have to tackle all of those. And database as a service, which yes, you can store any arbitrary data you want, but you still have to do the cluster management, and you also still have to customize this for your authorization use cases. We are seeing that companies other than Google are starting to build on the Zanzibar paper. And Airbnb and Carta actually built their own internal versions of authorization systems inspired by Google Zanzibar. And we're also seeing that there are alternatives to use this as a service or even open source. So Odd Zero, I, uh, disclaimer, I'm working on this, uses uh, Project Sandcastle, and that's our implementation of a Zanzibar as a service. And there are alternatives like Oriquito and Odd Zero. Now, let me kind of like give you a demo of what a system like this looks like. So I'm going to share my other screen. And OK, uh, one sec. There we go. So this is what you need to do to work with a Zanzibar system. The first thing you need to do is you need to define what we call your namespaces. And your namespaces are your authorization model. So let's say you're, you're modeling something like Google Drive, a bit simpler. So you might have, for example, a group, and you say that groups have members. So you specify all relations that the type of object, in this case, the group, can have. And then, for example, a document have, can have other relations. For example, some relations might be permissions, like change owner, and read, and share, and write. These are kind of like verbs, so you might document them like that. And you might also have kind of like roles for a specific document. Let's call them that. But they are also still relationships. Viewer and uh, sorry, owner are the relations. So once you've defined your model, and what we have here on the right is kind of like a visual representation of, of that model, you can start asking questions. For example, uh, sorry, you can start adding data to the system. That's the second thing you do. So for example, here we have Anne, and we can say that Anne is a viewer of a document, right? Let's say you have in your database document one. Now, and, and the, the idea of the document would probably be UIDs or ints that you have in your database as identifiers, but you can go create that tuple. And we can also say that Bob is an owner of document one. So now that we've added some authorization data, what we can do is we can ask questions to the system. And this is the third thing. So the first thing is we define our authorization model. The second thing is we start adding authorization-related data. And then we can ask questions like, how is an related to the document as feed? And for example, oh, one sec, I missed a space here. There we go. And Anne can read the document, right? She has that permission because she's a viewer of the document. And as a viewer, she has the read permission. And this is what we document we said here, right? Like for example, here we write that read is anyone that's an owner or a viewer. So that's hopefully clear. But if we ask, can Anne write? Well, naturally she can't. She is a viewer. So she shouldn't be able to write. And we see that fail here. Bob, on the other hand, can write because Bob is an owner of the document. And when we look at the definition for writer, we see that it has owner here. So if Bob is an owner of the document, he should be able to write. And because he's an owner, he can write. And that's kind of like how this works. So the power here is that all of these things are APIs, right? If I come here and I open my DevTools, what you will see is that each of these are actually an HTTP request. Oh, let me just try to open the DevTools again. Okay, so it's not working. I think it's some, it might be something with the screen sharing. So essentially, all of these are an HTTP request. And what we're passing are these three things. We're passing Bob, we're passing Dog1, and we're passing write. 
And the same thing goes for adding these tuples and these relationships to the system. That's an HTTP request. And even setting up configuration can be done through the API. So if you're a developer, you have a full API at your disposal in that regard. Let me go back to the slides. Mm -hmm. One sec, I need to refine that window. Okay, there we go. Um, one sec. There we go. So the advantages here are that auditing becomes part of the as a service. Authorization change management is simpler because you handle all of this through the API and you don't need to have this in your code. It's easy to understand what logic applies because you have this all in your namespaces configuration, which is your authorization model, but it's also multi-region and operated by someone else. I'm going to kind of like skip over a couple of slides because I went over the uh, allotted time because of like screen switching. But my final thought here is it should be fairly clear that authorization is on the rise, hopefully from this conversation, and that there are different solutions to solve this out there. My recommendation is don't solve this yourself. Figure out how you can put together different, uh, a solution from different tools out there, and hopefully you will be able to focus on the core of your business. Uh, I want to leave you with a few resources. We have a wait list for Project Suncastle, and we have a whole bunch of links. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Uh, that was actually my, my very first question is uh, I'd like to share the resources. And so um, for everybody uh, joining us in the audience, these these presentations and the video will be um, will be uh, posted in a few days. They'll be available. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, send me a chat in the window and I can send you any of the links that Damien has in his presentation uh, if you'd like to get started. And, and Damien, can you come just to keep me honest here? Uh, Zanzibar is an open source project and, and you were sharing Sandcastle, which is off zero's sort of implementation of that method? Uh, Zanzibar is not an open source project. Okay. Zanzibar is a paper. And then okay. based on that paper, there are a couple of open source projects. But Zancast, Project Zancaster is kind of like our implementation, taking that paper and implementing it for uh, SAS code. OK. Um, and in your experience, do you find, are, are there applications or um, um, uh, types of APIs for which this, which, the, which this is not a good fit um, for uh, authorization? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we actually had a slide on this. I had to skip it because of time. But there are cases where you might have to still do authorization based on transient data, for example, the time of day. And in that case, relationships are not easily representable via time. Now, there are ways in which you can do that. And because uh, we we have Obsido, the identity provider, and we have Suncastle, which is the authorization checker, we can make those work. Uh, and that's a feature that we're actually thinking about for after the dev community preview. Uh, mm -hmm. But it doesn't naturally fit that model, which means like people have to do a, a shift of mindset. That's also where you can use a combination of both policies and Suncastle, mostly thinking as Suncastle as a very good geolocated PIP to achieve a combination of these cases. Great. Um, and then that puts us at time. Damien, thank you so much for your for your time and presentation today.